Well, thank you so much for such a, a warm welcome. It's really good to be here. Um, I am married. I have three children, a 16-year-old daughter, 15-year-old son, and a 12-year-old, another 12-year-old daughter. And uh, recently, we have a, a new arrival as well, the pitter-patter of small feet. Um, sadly, we gave in and we bought a dog. Uh, it's a toy poodle, and anyone who's thinking of getting a dog, just don't do it. Um, that's all I would say. Um, when people in Hawley see me with what I can only describe as a black duster on the end of a piece of string, I'm six foot five, it is utterly ridiculous. So, but there we are, enough about me. So it's great to be here. Um, this morning, uh, I have entitled this Bold Witness, Bold Response. So um, another title could be Being Bold, Loving Strangers and Expecting the Inevitable. Uh, and I want to tell you a story harking back to the days. Adrian has set me up perfectly. Back to the days of where we used to go out and we used to knock on doors and we used to speak to people about Jesus. And, and I want to share you a story uh, of something that happened, which is probably one of my favorite stories of going out and, and being bold. And it really helps to uh, explain what we're talking about this morning. So we used to go out and we'd get feedback as to you know, what had happened when we'd knocked on people's doors, people we'd met, and sometimes we'd go out during the day, maybe on a Saturday, and just speak to people about Jesus. And one particular occasion, um, as a friend of mine, uh, let's call him Richard, because that was his name. And... Uh, we went out, and he went out with a couple of people, and he came across uh, a bunch of young men, and he started to tell them about his faith, and he started to talk to them uh, about Jesus, and he said, Look, I, I believe that God is able to heal all things. And the group of people he was speaking to were a, a group of three or four, I think, blind young men. And so um, Richard asked, can I pray for you? So as he sort of fed this story back, we were on the edge of our seats. What, you know, what happened next? This is, this is amazing. We'd only been Christians a, a few years, and, and someone is going to pray for someone who's blind. So Richard said, well, I remember uh, the story in the Bible where Jesus, he spat on the ground, and he made um, some mud, and then he put it in the blind person's eyes. So we thought, No. No, you, you didn't do that, Richard, did you? And he said, well, they couldn't see what I was doing. <laughs> so, and I, I can't remember whether he spat on the ground or not, but he said, I, I, I spat on my hand and, and I just rubbed it in their eye and, and I, I, I prayed for them. Now, at this point, I had really mixed feelings about this. Uh, on the one hand, I, I felt disgusted that someone would spit in someone's eye but on the other hand, I thought, wow, your faith in God is amazing. The fact that you have done that, you've taken God um, perhaps too literally at his word, but, you know, there's nothing wrong with that if that's what you felt was the right thing to do. And you're probably thinking, well, what happened next? This is, a, this is an amazing story. What happened? Well, the truth is that the young man wasn't healed. He didn't get his, his sight back. But the reason I, I tell you this story is not to discuss the theology of, of spitting. Um, and I know there are a couple of occasions where Jesus used saliva. It's to encourage you and challenge you to be bold in your faith. Now, I realize this is way out there for some of you. you think, if you think at the end of this, I'm going to go out into Camberley and start spitting, uh, it's just not going to happen. I'm talking about small steps of boldness as you trust in Jesus. And it's also important for some of you here. Now, the, the great thing about um, preaching in a, in a church where you don't know anyone is I don't know anyone in this room, apart from a, a few people. I don't know whether you're here as a, a person who's been a Christian for years, or maybe you've walked through these doors today, and this is the first time you've been in an environment where you're hearing about Jesus, where people are worshipping God. And for some of you this morning, it might be that you too need to take a bold step, maybe just a very small step towards knowing who Jesus is. So this is for you as well this morning. So I remember that day I was challenged so much. I'd probably been a, a Christian for maybe a few years, but it made me think, what would it take for me to be that confident in my faith 
that I would trust Jesus so much that I would offer to, to pray for someone in that way, pr pray for someone who's blind. And also, what stops us from being that bold now? With this faith, we stand here and we sing about uh, the glories of God and we put our confidence in Him and it's wonderful and we think we can take on the world, but when we get outside, when we meet people, it can be a slightly different story. So I wonder how that makes you feel. I wonder whether your faith is challenged when you hear stories or accounts of other people, of what they do in the Lord. So I'd like us to turn uh, to the book of Acts, uh, to Acts 14. So if you have your Bibles with you, you can turn there, all the, the words will come up on the screens. Now Acts is written to give us an account of, of the growth of the early church and the preaching of the gospel in, in, in various places. And you might have heard that the, the book of Acts is, is known as the Acts of the Apostles, um, but it only actually mentions a few of the apostles, uh, including Paul. And now, Paul became a, a believer in about 33 AD, and then 13 years later, he goes on his first missionary journey. And um, there's a map here. For those of you, I know some people really like maps. Um, so um, you can see this journey uh, that was taken. It's, it's, it's probably uh, quite difficult to see on that screen. There we go. This is a bit closer. Um, and you can see there uh, that we have uh, Paul and Barnabas who were on their first journey and they set off from Antioch in Syria to Seleucia, then over to Cyprus, uh, to Salamis and then Paphos and across to Perga uh, where John Mark goes to Jerusalem and then Antioch and you'll notice that there are two Antiochs on that map. And then here we have Iconium which is uh, actually right in the middle of Turkey as uh, now um, and so far, they've been driven out of every city that they've been to. Uh, there are people that have been quite jealous of the response that they've had. And we reach Acts 14, having, they've just been thrown out of one place, and they arrive in Iconium. And this is where we pick up um, the story. And this is uh, Saul and, uh, Paul and Barnabas. And I will read this to you. So this is God's word for us this morning. Now at Iconium, they entered together into a Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So they remained a long time speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the people of the city were divided, some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. When an attempt was made by both the Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them, they learned of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia, and to the surrounding country. And there they continued to preach the gospel. So, sometimes we, we read scripture, we read the stories of of the apostles, of the disciples, of followers of Jesus. And, and sometimes you can think, well, they had it really easy because they did some amazing things. They had some really great results. They had some wonderful things that happened. But actually, it was a, a really difficult and tough job that they had. In as much as they had people respond, there was also the other side of that coin where they had rejection, where they had opposition. And it's fair to say they had a lot of opposition. So how did they do this? How did they manage to keep going? Well, first of all, they weren't doing this in their own strength. And church, nor are you. No matter what you think of yourself and your abilities and your giftings and talents to be able to go and share your faith, you're not on your own. And at the beginning of Acts, we're reminded what Jesus said. And you'll be very familiar with these, these words. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So there's a very obvious link here between receiving power from the Holy Spirit and our ability to go and share our faith and be bold witnesses of Jesus. So thank God that we're not on our own, that it's not down to us, that it's not down to our skills or, or what we look like, or, or even, to some degree, the words that we say. And so often it can seem 
difficult when we're out and we're speaking with our neighbours or we're at the school gate or the place that you work or whatever it is you do. It can seem that it's so difficult. How do I start speaking to someone? What do I say? But the Holy Spirit gives you power. God with us now gives us everything we need. That means that we can go to Red Hill, where I'm from, or to Camberley, all the surrounding places, wherever it is you are, and you have God with you. When you step out of your house in the morning, or out of your flat, or whatever it is where you live and the place you go, you have God with you. And you have confidence that He can do amazing things through the things you say and, and through your actions. And Paul and Barnabas, they were being witnesses. They were telling people about Jesus. They were saying, saying that Jesus lived. He died. He rose from the dead. He was Christ. He was the Savior. He was the person you've been waiting for. God himself come to earth for you. This is what they were saying. And in Acts 13, we read that the, uh, they were set apart, Barnabas and Paul, they were set apart for the work which I have called them. So what was this work? This work was that they would preach the gospel, that they would preach the good news. And it seems that they did an excellent job of this. As we've read, they had many people, both Jews and uh, Gentiles, Gentiles being non-Jews, they believed. They came to know Jesus. They put their faith in him, which is excellent, well done, great job. But they also had opposition and rejection. The unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds. Poisoned their minds. Perhaps they were interested and then slowly but surely their eyes were taken off of Jesus and maybe more onto the things of the world, the things that they had previously learned and been taught. And they traveled from cities where similar things happened. Many believed, but many rejected them. And no doubt, Paul and Barnabas, they were used to this kind of response as they went from place to place. But we're told at the end of chapter 13, and this is amazing, we are told that they are full of joy, full of the Holy Spirit, and eager to keep going. There was nothing holding them back. They were full of joy, even though there were threats of death. It's unlikely that many people in this room will be threatened with death if you share your faith. But here we have an example of people who were so eager to let people know of the good news of Jesus. I wonder, can you relate to this? Is it possible that you have a neighbour or a friend or a work colleague, maybe perhaps someone that you might be inviting to your house Maybe next week, maybe your next door neighbor, you think, actually, I'll get them to come along with me. They can come and have a meal. Or maybe there's someone that you've been thinking about talking to. Is it possible that you could speak to them and you could say, look, I just want to, I just want to share my faith with you. I just want to tell you a little bit about what I did on Sunday. And they say, say no more. I'm convinced. Just take me to church. Just get me there now. You don't have to do anything else. In fact, lead me to Jesus immediately. That's wonderful, that could happen. But perhaps you're more used to someone not quite getting there immediately. Maybe you've even faced a bit of rejection yourself, or opposition, or feeling like you haven't got so much joy, but you're despairing because you thought you were doing so well in speaking to someone, and then suddenly something's happened where they seem to have taken their gaze off of Jesus, and they're going in a different direction. And it's so easy as, as Christians, as those who follow Jesus, in fact, not even as Christians, as anyone, it's easier to hold on to rejection than praise. And the problem is, is with rejection is it's a, a way more potent fuel than praise. If rejection were glue, it would be super glue. And praise would be a bit more like Pritstick. 
It's a little bit sticky, but it doesn't really do the job that well. I mean, for instance, if after this talk, 10 people came up to me, and again, I realise I'm opening myself up for, for something quite awkward here, but if 10 people came up to me and said, Mark, that was, let's say, that was an average talk. Thank you so much. I'd be really grateful for that. And maybe just one person came up and said, actually, that was really helpful. It really encouraged me, and I, I'm going to be a... I, I just feel that the Lord spoke to me, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to do some good things for the Lord this week. Thank you very much. I think, praise God. But if one person came up to me and said, ah, oh, that was, to be honest with you, I was expecting a bit more from a, a guest speaker. Um, <laughs> It was a bit poor, and I didn't want to get out of bed this morning. You made me, and frankly, if, if they don't ask you back, um, that would be okay. <laughs> um, guess which comment sticks? It will be that one. It will be that one that I'm thinking about all the way home. It's the rejection that sticks with us. But listen, if we know what to expect... If we know, as we're sharing our faith, we know the two different sides that we might get, then it's a lot easier. And we can be confident as we put down our nets to see what we catch. Now, you might think, oh, wow, that's prophetic. It's not, I heard what Adrian said last week. <laughs> but as we put down our nets, we can be confident that there will be people who... Um, will want to hear what we have to say. There will be people who respond, but at the same time, there will be those who perhaps don't quite get it, and they're on a journey, and they're taking small steps, and that's okay. Jesus says this when he sent out 72 people to preach good news and, and heal the sick. He said, whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, Go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. And this is symbolic of, of judgment against that town, but ultimately it's God that deals with people. We don't have to worry about that. And as Paul and Barnabas at the end of Acts 13, they, they took these words, they took this advice and they said they shook off the dust from their feet against them and they went to Iconium and the disciples were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. It's not on you, it doesn't matter that you have the answer to why people might respond in the way that they do. You don't have to take that upon yourself. But you can be full of joy because the kingdom of God has come near someone because you have been in their presence. Isn't that mind-blowing? You have God with you. The kingdom of God has come near. When you give someone a smile, when you talk to someone, when you invite someone to have a coffee with you maybe who is having a hard time, when you get alongside a work colleague who's struggling, the kingdom of God has come near that person. And why were they able to do this? Well, they were bold. They were full of the Holy Spirit. They were bold in what they said. And this word bold means uh, that they had freedom in speaking, to speak openly and frankly without ambiguity. It meant without fear. And it isn't just a case of of being brave. It's more that they didn't hold back from sharing the truth with people that they met. Freedom to speak truth. Obedient faith. You carry truth with you. This morning, if you are here and you don't know Jesus, we are talking truth. We are singing truth. Everything that's done here, this incredible setup, Everything you see is done because there is a truth, and that is that Jesus is alive, and he wants to know you. So Paul and Barnabas knew that they were going to get a fierce response. And it's no surprise that we get the same response today. Nothing has changed. The gospel is offensive. When we talk about what Jesus has done... It's a real offence. When we talk about knowing God himself, and there's one way to know him, it's an offence. And maybe you're, you're here today and you've never put your faith in Jesus. You've never put your trust in Jesus to make Jesus the only person you follow. 
and the only way. Because Jesus is the only way when it comes to religions and all the religions you might hear about. There is no other way. You could think, well, that's okay for my friends, but I'm okay. Well, no. The truth is, if Jesus is the truth, then he is the truth for everyone. He loves you. He came for you. He died for you. He rose from death for you. He accepts you and he wants you to know him. And he accepts you exactly the way you are. He came to us when we were in the most mess we could be in. We don't have to jump through hoops to meet Jesus. Now, that is offensive talk. It's exclusive. There is only one way. But there is peace. There is life to be found in Jesus. If you don't know him this morning, I want to encourage you. Be bold in taking that step towards him. So we, like Paul and Barnabas, we need to ensure that we're prepared and we can expect a bit of a reaction. And I believe that the Holy Spirit will give us the power to go into all sorts of situations, into all sorts of places. And you might be rejected, you might feel opposition, but it won't be a personal attack on you. But I know what it's like, that feeling of isolation. But we can be prepared for that. But I don't know if you've ever felt isolated. Well, I don't know if you've ever felt that you've stood out in a crowd. My brother, my youngest brother, he's, he's not like me. And in a moment, I'll ex- you'll understand why he's not like me. But a, a number of years ago, he was reminding me of this story. He um, did something called a naked bike ride. Now, a naked bike ride doesn't need much explaining, but it is, yes, you're on a bike naked. And there's a whole group of people that apparently do this. Hands up if you... No, don't. So he, he did one in central London. So they met in Hyde Park, and everyone turned up with their bikes and a bag. Very important to have your bag, because then you take all your clothes off, you put them in your bag, and then you get on your bike. So there are hundreds of people that... Um, I, I won't tell you where the next one is, just in case you're tempted to go along. Um, Hundreds of people turned up in Hyde Park for this naked bike ride. Uh, My brother was there with his friends, and the the, the clock was ticking. It was time for them all to go, and a couple of my brother's friends hadn't turned up. So they had to wait for them. So they waited and waited, and then all of a sudden, everyone just left, apart from my brother and his few friends, and they were sort of near Hyde Park corner, and... Their friends finally arrived, and they took their clothes off, got on their bikes, and there was about six of them, and they realised that it was just them and the rest of London looking at them. And they sat there, and they realised they didn't quite know what direction everyone else had gone in, and they're on their bikes. And to add to their, their horror of this moment of feeling totally exposed, a group of tourists arrived with their cameras and started taking pictures of them. Now, the reason I tell this story, but I wonder if sometimes it can feel a little bit like that for you as a Christian. You feel okay when you're here with all of your like-minded friends and people who love Jesus and we stand and we sing and we put our arms in the air and we say lots of strange Christian stuff. But when you're out there, do you feel that you are exposed? Do you feel like you're not quite like them? Do you feel sometimes scared to say some words of truth and to really talk about the things that are close to your heart? But here's an amazing fact which dawned on me as I prepared this message. Most of your life, those of you who are followers of Jesus, you will be in the minority wherever you go. Now, yes, I want there to be revival. I want that not to be the case. But most of your life, you will be in the minority. And they, these two characters from our passage this morning, they went to those who needed Jesus. Jesus himself said he came to seek and save the lost. And we live in a world, especially 
around here in Camberley, Red Hill, where people simply think that they don't need God at all. Because we have massive Audi showrooms. We have a Costco. We have a drive through Costa. All of these things, we don't need God. But what you can't get from an Audi showroom is something that brings you peace, eternal peace. You can't take away life from a, a Costco and buy it in bulk. You can't buy a takeaway eternity with our God who loves us from a Costa. You can't do these things. We have something. And the more we realize we have good news. The more we realize that actually being exposed and being a bit vulnerable is an awkward thing, but knowing that what we have is so much better than any opposition you may get or any staring at you because you might have said something slightly strange. Now, to end my story, my um, brother, he finally found his group of friends. They rode off and they went in the right direction and, and he was okay. So I know some of you might be worrying about that. But feeling isolated, maybe being mocked, standing out in the crowd, we can experience joy in these moments, despite what our surroundings might be. And I personally think that there are a few reactions that are wonderful to get when you share your faith, when you talk of Jesus to other people. And they're things like this, irreverence. Rudeness, maybe a bit of mocking, they're okay. Because what has happened is there has been a reaction. There's been a reaction to the truth. There's been a reaction to perhaps you sharing something that's come up against the opposition of the world. There's nothing wrong with that. We should rejoice in that. We shouldn't be scared of that. Or even interest of any kind, just a, a small flicker of interest, or perhaps a question. These are wonderful things to have as we share our faith, as we go about our day-to-day -day lives. And I think that God is at work when we have either of those responses. And these polarized responses to Jesus are all throughout the New Testament. In Jesus' hometown of Nazareth, when Jesus returned to his hometown, some were amazed at his teaching and his miracles, but others were sceptical and even offended, leading to unbelief. A rich young ruler, you'll read about this in Mark, he approached Jesus and when Jesus challenged him to sell his possessions and follow him, all was looking good, but no, he left sorrowful because it meant that he had to question himself on what he thought was good. Even at Jesus' crucifixion, some people reviled and mocked Jesus, while others, like the centurion, they confessed. Two opposing responses. At Pentecost, you'll know when the Holy Spirit came, when the Holy Spirit fell on the followers of Jesus, some in the crowd were amazed and believed. But others, they mocked and they accused them of being drunk. When Paul was addressing philosophers in Athens, some were curious and they were interested and they wanted to know more. But others, they mocked him and dismissed him. You see, these examples, they illustrate the diverse and polarized reactions that people have when we share our faith. Some people respond with great interest. Some people dismiss what is being said. But as, we, as I draw to a close, and perhaps if the band would like to come forward, um, I'd like to leave you with a challenge this morning. And this challenge is this, and this is to two different groups of people. The first challenge is that you might be bold in sharing your faith as a follower of, of Jesus. It might be the, the simplest conversation to start a conversation. But before you 
go out every day. I don't know at what point of the day those of you who have given your life to follow Christ, I don't know at what point in your day you remember that you are a follower of Jesus. And I know that might sound like a strange thing to say. But I'd suggest that it's a good moment in the day to just come before God in the morning and just say, Lord, fill me with your spirit for today. Let me be an example of you to someone. Let me reflect your love to someone that I meet this morning or this afternoon or this evening. And you may not even get to mentioning the name of Jesus. You may not get to say the word God. You may not even say something particularly spiritual. But what you're doing is you're bringing the kingdom of God near to that person. And there's stuff that God can do that is beyond our comprehension, beyond our imagination. So ask the Lord to give you what he freely gives, his spirit, so we can go, so we can meet others who need to know Jesus. And thank God for those moments. Thank God for those moments when people avoid you, where people say things that seem to be mean or unkind. Thank God for those moments, because that's nothing new. Jesus experienced that himself. And the second challenge is for those who are here who have never taken a step towards Jesus. Or you might think, you know, it's time I started to explore this person that everyone is so excited about. And today you can find out more. Today as we, as we worship, I just want to encourage you just to think, if this is really true, if we have hundreds, thousands of years of history of people wanting to let other people know about Jesus, then just ask the Lord to give you boldness to take some steps before him. And I promise you, I promise you, he will meet you where you are at. He will take you just as you are. And at the end of the meeting over here, you'll see some people with some lanyards on, the prayer team. If you just want to go up to them and say, I'm not even sure why I'm here, but I want you to pray for me. That would be a wonderful thing to do. If I can invite everyone to stand, I'm going to pray and then we will worship God. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word that we have incredible stories of your grace using ordinary people people who were once heading in one direction Paul once someone who had a joy in killing those who were believers yet his life was turned around by you and Barnabas the encourager who welcomed Paul into the church who vouched for him and they went and they they went to those who hated them went to those who had another way of living, yet you used them to start the church and start many churches. And Lord, today, I pray, Holy Spirit, you would give us boldness to be your witnesses in the places that we are. I pray, Father, that you would increase the amount of people that we see in this room over the next few, few weeks and months. I pray, Jesus, that we would bring light where there is darkness. We would bring life where there is death. Lord, would you use every single person in this place for your glory, for your name, and for your fame. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hey guys, before you go, we just want to say a massive thank you for watching this video today. My name's Chris, I'm part of the leadership team here at the Beacon Church. You know, as a church, we have a big vision. We believe that we exist to help people to know God, to find freedom, to discover their purpose, and to make a difference. If this video has made a difference in your life today, then make sure you check out our other content in our playlist. We believe it's going to really help you out. And don't forget to like and subscribe as you go. Well, that's all from me today. Take care. God bless.